What a joy divine. Welcome you to the God's Word portion of the worship from Daleville Christian Church. We begin with our advertisement, which we've been running this year, and will continue to do so. Students, pastors looking for employment as pastors looking to move, this is a job opportunity for one or more of you. Daleville Christian Church will retire its long-serving pastor in another year. Daleville Christian Church is an independent Christian church looking to find the next lead pastor of this small but forward-looking congregation. Eventually, it is intended that this position lead toward the full-time lead pastor position upon my retirement. What is available now is an associate's position, full or part-time, for training in the life of Daleville Christian Church for the future of the congregation. Uh, send inquiries or resumes to me um, at DalevillePastor1, that's DalevillePastor1, at Mac.com. I also like to remind uh, listeners that each one of us decides in our own heart whether we will believe in God, or which God, if any, we will believe in. To leave these matters of the heart undecided is similar to leaving a boat unanchored at dock or port. One would have to hope that the wind won't come up, or the storm, or the hurricane will land somewhere else far away. Anchors and matters of the heart should not be decided in a state of emergency. How many of us are that cool under that kind of pressure? in a crisis. You can take time today or this week to consider and decide these matters. They can remain open for re review, but have the basics down, at least. Then you can live what you believe, always less stressful, always more peaceful to live what you believe. I can only talk about Jesus. As a minister, I'm a minister of God's Word, the Bible. I don't know anything else to talk about. I can only speak with any authority on matters of my own heart. You will have to decide about matters of your heart. We also like to begin with an affirmation of our faith. And uh, we will use one from Luke in the first chapter where we read, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. To show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. May the Lord add his blessing to that reading of his holy word, which is an affirmation of our faith. We come to Luke also for God's word today in the 16th chapter, the 19th through the 31st verses. This is a story that Jesus tells about a man named Lazarus who was poor and a rich man who saw him every day. And then the rich man died. Let's see Jesus' story. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked this man's sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus was by his side. So the formerly rich man called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, 
Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things? But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. The formerly rich man answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. We're looking at religion in America. We began last time looking at religion in America, and I referred you to the Fetzer study of spirituality in the United States, 2020. The Fetzer study shows us that even if you only claim to be spiritual or simply religious does not automatically mean that you participate more in spiritual or religious activities. The study suggests that when we are left to ourselves on deciding what we believe we should do and what we should believe, we participate less in spiritual and religious practices Religious practices that have been the very definition of faith practice for over thousands of years. Let that rest there a minute. To be spiritual or religious in America tends to mean that you pray less, not more. That you don't attend worship because you will claim to be unaffiliated with any standard group or organization, and even if you claim a denomination, we on average attend worship services less than earlier generations of Americans. That was last week. I'm sorry if you missed it. It's available on the church's website, the YouTube channel, and Daleville Christian Church's website. <clears throat> now, please excuse me because I misspoke last week. I missed a group last week that I should have mentioned. So, I begin today with an apology to you and anyone who heard the last sermon message. I had stated I was not aware of a religion or spiritual movement in the U.S. that put Christian Bible statements together with violence. There has been such a group. And they've been around for years, and they still exist. The group was once known as the Christian Identity Movement, with its ideas linked to numerous domestic terrorist attacks in the late 20th century. Christian identity has significantly influenced the development of the American far-right extremism as an anti-Semitic and racist belief system. Christian identity provides religious justification for violence and domestic terrorism. Although the traditional CI movement has declined, Christian identity has risen in importance as a radicalizing and mobilizing force within existing neo-fascist, accelerationist communities. As I read years ago why people joined such radical groups, the man said the Ku Klux Klan was not violent enough. They don't kill enough people. So along with the Westboro Baptist Church, we can add the Christian identity movement, people who believe that we are to hate others as a part of our religious duty. So along with these people who claim to be spiritual or religious or even biblical, we add some other groups you've heard about or read about 
And I know you have because they appeared in America in the late 20th century. But we can find groups of people who wanted to follow Jesus, but instead of following Jesus with an old school group or church, they decided to follow individuals who had their own interpretation of the Bible. You remember these people. David Koresh was the head of the Branch Davidians, a religious group and offshoot of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. David Koresh claimed to be its final prophet, and his group in Waco, Texas, chose to believe him. And when authorities were concerned for the people's welfare in their compound, especially the children, the group chose to resist. Ten adults died in the first fight, first gunfight, four were federal agents, when offered to leave the compound peaceably, about 55 adults chose not to leave. 21 children had no choice. You might remember that the group had about 50 days to make a decision. So the 55 adults decided every day of the 50 days that they were not leaving their compound. And obviously the adults decided their children were not leaving either. When fire broke out, 79 people died. You might remember the Reverend Jim Jones, founder and leader of the People's Temple. This group is of interest to us because it began here in our state. You might recall the People's Temple of the Disciples of Christ, originally People's Temple Full Gospel Church and commonly shortened to People's Temple, was an American new religious organization Founded in Indianapolis, Indiana by Reverend Jim Jones, the People's Temple spread a message that combined elements of Christianity with communist and socialist ideology. Christian identities got the far-right uh, political spectrum. The People's Temple had the far-left political spectrum. Communist and socialist ideology with an emphasis on racial equality. Jones moved the group to California in the 1960s but there was controversy. Jones' assistant pastor, Russell Winberg, strongly resisted Jones' efforts to move the congregation and warned that Jones was abandoning Christianity. But 140 Hoosiers decided to follow Jim Jones. It wasn't smooth sailing for the church in California, and the press, including Christian writers, were wanting to expose the people's temple as a cult. Jones frequently warned his followers of an imminent, apocalyptic, genocidal race war and nuclear war. He claimed that the Nazi fascists and the white supremacists would put people of color into concentration camps. Jones said he was a messiah sent to save people by giving them a place of refuge in the church. Another story in the press was going to appear, so Jones apparently decided that the U.S. would not accept his teachings, and the group left for Guyana, South America. When a U.S. representative went to Guyana to investigate, and some of the People's Temple members told the congressman they wanted to leave, Jim Jones feared the whole community would collapse. When the congressman was leaving with People's Temple defectors, a People's Temple security detail opened fire on the group, killing Representative Brian, three journalists, and one defector, injuring nine others. That evening, Reverend Jim Jones ordered a mass suicide. 918 people died, including 276 children. There were a few who ran through the jungle. As many as 33 fled and up to 80 survivors not including followers in the United States, survived. They chose to live. Laura Johnston Cole chose to live that day, is now an author, a bilingual school teacher in California, and a Quaker. She turned, she made a choice, maybe a choice forced upon her, but she chose to live and she remained affiliated with an established faith group. She has her own website, jonestownsurvivor.com. 
But what she and other survivors want people to know is that there was choice for many people until that last evening at Jonestown in Guyland. The survivors do not believe that they were brainwashed or coerced in any way. Having said that, not everyone chose suicide that night in Jonestown, and some were murdered. But African-American Christine Miller, a longtime Temple member who joined in Los Angeles, fought with Jim Jones in the moments leading up to the deaths, the suicides in Jonestown. She stood up in the pavilion and said, as long as there is life, there is hope. That's my faith. Hers was a choice, and it was much more biblical. Jesus told the disciples, and the disciples told us, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You may remember Marshall Applewhite, Heaven's Gate Group, San Diego, California, 1997. He organized their mass suicide in 1997. It's the largest, still the largest mass suicide to occur inside the U.S. Applewhite and an accomplice discussed mysticism at length and concluded that they were called as divine messengers. They traveled the U.S. and gained one convert. But eventually, Applewhite was able to gain more followers in believing that the Hale-Bopp comet had a spaceship behind it and that the vessel would take their spirits on board for a journey to another planet while leaving their earthly bodies behind. Believing that their souls would ascend to the spaceship and be given new bodies, the group members committed mass suicide in a rented mash, uh, mansion, their 39 suicides in all. There are various opinions on how the followers became followers of Marshall Applewhite. Were they followers of Applewhite or did they more believe Applewhite's message about the spaceship and the Hellbop comet? Either way, they certainly believed themselves to be spiritual. Too spiritual to continue to live in earthly bodies. Some of Applewhite's final words in a video message were, we do in all honesty hate this world. Friends, Jesus came to this world out of love for you and me. And Jesus came to this world out of love for his father's world to redeem it. I think you want to particularly take a look at um, a passage in the book of the prophet Isaiah. It's in the 40s. I, can't, I, I don't have the citation with me. Jesus came out of love for his Father's world to redeem it. To redeem it. Not forsake it. To get the world back for God. To defeat the evil forces in this world that we might have life to the full. A life that will continue with the Heavenly Father forever because of Jesus. Life with Jesus is better. We can know this. We can know all this through God's Word, the Bible. Although Marshall Applewhite studied theology, he apparently missed Paul's letters that said we must respect the body, not detest it. Jesus had a resurrection body on earth that Sunday we call Easter. But Jesus had a body. Now it's true that many people like Jim Jones or David Koresh or even Marshall Applewhite quoted the Bible. There have been and always will be flakes claiming authority that is not rightfully theirs. And Jesus said it would happen in Mark chapter 13. The choice is yours. 
I always suggest reading the Bible and staying with an old school group that can point to years, decades, centuries of experience in living and following Jesus. Now the next statistic comes from Cornell University. Americans make 226.7 choices each day on food alone. You know it's true because only a real research scientist would be sure to include the point seven. 226.7 food choices every day. And they're part of 35,000 choices the average American makes every day. Last week I lifted up young men who chose to murder people. African Americans were their chosen victims. One of the young men at the age of 18 decided to become a racist. No one made those young men racist or forced them to kill. They chose that. I mentioned a man who claimed to want to become a Buddhist monk. What we do know about that man is he never got his anger under control. He became a murderer and continued to use violence in his relationships with other people, certainly the woman he called a girlfriend. We don't know if these men chose to be spiritual or religious, but they certainly cannot be accused of wanting to follow Jesus. You and I have the freedom to choose. We may have too many choices in America, but that's not because freedom is a problem. We have too many choices because we aren't good at making choices for ourselves. If you want to drink and drive, you can. You might get caught, but 10 million people a year make the decision they will drink and drive. We just aren't good at making decisions for ourselves. One aspect I've appreciated about the Christian church tradition in which this church has stood for over 150 years is that unity is only desired in essentials with regard to faith. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity, for example. If you ask about tithing here at Daleville Christian Church, that is giving 10% of your income to the church or church work, we would tell you, or I would tell you, wherever you want to give it, the tithe could be a goal for you to work toward. Giving a tithe can be a spiritual discipline, but giving a tithe is not required by Daleville Christian Church, or its pastor, or its eldership. We won't require anything of your giving except that you ask the Lord what the Lord wants you to give. And in what way the Lord wants you to give it. You have that freedom. What and how you give is not essential. It's a liberty. A part of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Your giving is not a part of your relationship with Daleville Christian Church. And in charity, you accept where everyone else is in their relationship with the Lord with regard to giving. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And this too points to not a dependence on your personal opinion about giving. We want to point you to what the Lord wants of you with regard to your giving. The leadership at Daleville Christian Church does not tell you what to do in your relationship to Jesus, but the leadership encourages you in your relationship to Jesus. That is an essential. At Daleville Christian Church, you would not need a Reverend Jim Jones or a David Koresh or a Marshall Applewhite to have a more spiritual relationship with God. We would direct you to God's Word, and we would direct you to prayer. We would share with you the past practices of Christians in history and sometimes the people who attended Daleville Christian Church, but we won't decide for you, and we don't want you to decide for other people in the church either. 
in essential unity and non-essential liberty in all things. Yeah. If as an American you believe that you know what is best, we will differ with you. We believe that the Lord knows what is best. If as an average American and you are overwhelmed with too many choices, we won't tell you what to do. We will direct you to the one who knows what you want to do. As I have said so many times, you can probably say it with me. Even as your pastor, I do not know the way to heaven. But I do know the one who does know the way to heaven. I suggest you talk with him and you follow him, Jesus. We read Jesus' story today because in that story, the rich man has concerns that his brothers will miss the truth that he missed. And the dead rich man asks to go to his brother, asks Lazarus to go to his brothers to convince them that how we live our lives makes a difference and eternal difference. And Abraham's words to the rich man, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Basically, Abraham was saying, your brothers are good Jews. They can read for themselves God's word and know how to live. The dead man protests. That's not enough. And Abraham says, basically, if God's word is not enough, isn't convincing enough, nothing will work. The people I have paraded in front of you today, many of them read God's word. Some insisted on their own interpretation for others and insisted others obey their interpretation. And too many chose to follow them. But some refused, declaring biblical truth, not dependent on human interpretation. You and they have God's word. Let them 